Hi everyone, this is Rachel, the project coordinator for our Early Psychosis Learning Collaborative. I just wanted to review a few housekeeping items with you all before we begin. Participant microphones will be muted at entry and you'll be able to unmute them during the discussion portion. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, please use the chat feature. And those attending today's live event will be eligible to request a certificate. More information regarding CEUs will be in a post-webinar follow-up email. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on our MHTTC website. And to reach us after the webinar, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Um, our MHTTC team is composed of C4 Innovations, Harvard University, and the Center for Educational Improvement. Our MHTTC's mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across New England. Our area of focus is geared towards recovery through recovery-oriented practices and support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. And to ensure the responsiveness of our work, we will actively develop and maintain a network composed of different stakeholders from each of the six states to guide our activities. And with that, it is my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Raquel Meshlam Gately for introductions. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, you'll see on the screen, or it looks like it, oh, there it is, disappeared. There's a poll. Um, we'd really appreciate it if everybody can fill that out. We'd like to get a sense of the representation uh, across our attendees today. So my name is Raquel Meshalem gately I'm a neuropsychologist from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, involved with the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of a series of initiatives by the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center on mental health care during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will be regularly updating these initiatives on our website, and we welcome any suggestions for other resources we can provide for wellness, recovery, and connection during these challenging times, not just for the people you serve, but for yourselves as well. As I'm sure you're all very well aware, uh, the pandemic has caused a marked disruption in healthcare and has resulted in a rapid increase in the utilization of telehealth, including for neuropsychological assessments. While remote neuropsychological evaluation has many advantages, health disparities exist in the delivery of these remote services across different racial, ethnic, geographic, and socioeconomic groups. And inequities are particularly significant for vulnerable and underrepresented groups, including people with serious mental illness. So I have invited my longtime and dear colleague, Dr. Maggie Lanka, to address this very important topic, um, both through her presentation and any questions you might have in the end. And we're really hoping that you won't be shy about asking questions, providing comments, or sharing ideas and resources. So feel free to type those questions, comments, and ideas into the chat box as you think of them and Dr. Lanka will respond to them right after she finishes her presentation. It's truly my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Lanka. Among the many hats she wears, she's the Director of Adult Neuropsychology and Psychological Testing and Training at Cambridge Health Alliance, and an Assistant Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. At Cambridge Health Alliance, Maggie directs the Neuropsychology Service and Neuropsychology Postdoctoral Fellowship. She teaches in the Psychiatry Department and she frequently lectures at Harvard Medical School on Neuropsychology. Her teaching reflects her interests and specialties in psychosis and cross-cultural neuropsychology. These interests developed at the postdoctoral level when she studied clinical neuropsychology and initiated a career-focused interest in the treatment of individuals with serious mental illness, 
with a particular emphasis on assessment. She co-developed a multidisciplinary early psychosis program in the psychiatry department at Cambridge Health Alliance, and she was charged with leading its assessment program. In addition to her academic and clinical work, Maggie is committed to the advancement of psychology, and she's been involved in professional advocacy through various committees and boards. She's currently the immediate past president of the Massachusetts Psychological Association and past president of the Massachusetts Neuropsychological Society. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Lanka for joining us today to speak about health disparities in remote neuropsychology for the treatment of serious mental illness during the time of COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you so much, Dr. Mashalom Gateway. It's, it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be invited. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So um, if you will just hang on for a second while I take care of the logistics here. Um, all right. Um, I think I'm ready to go. Uh, Raquel, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and if things are going oh, and you can see me? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> That's all. Oh, wait, no. It's not fast forward. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. So uh, thank, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, truly an honor to um, be here and to speak to you about this ever so important topic. Um, I'm going to be talking about how neuropsychology has adapted to, um, uh, to assessments during the COVID-19 era, but also, also with a keen eye on uh, some of the health disparities that um, it could be creating if it were not mindful of it. And uh, this summer, I had the distinct pleasure of speaking at the American Psychological Association on this very topic. I know that neuropsychologists um, are working hard to address some of these issues. And I think this um, really extends into a broader topic of health disparities in um, psychiatry and mental health treatment and healthcare. Um, much of what I'm gonna say that is. Um, I'm putting up this screen essentially just to say that I have no conflict of interest here. Um, also to, uh, to uh, mention that as part of my affiliation with the Interorganizational Practice Committee, which is an umbrella committee, neuropsychological committee at the national level, I also participated on a COVID task force that was uh, initiated in early April uh, to deal with um, the situation for neuropsychologists in terms of its adaptation to, uh, to treatment during a pandemic. So um, I, um, some of what I'm going to speak today really stems from the work of this task force. And I want to credit uh, the uh, many people that were part of this task force in thinking through how to adapt neuropsychology to this um, pandemic. Um, it was um, certainly a challenging uh, a situation for neuropsychologists since the type of work that we do cannot be easily uh, adapted uh, to uh, telehealth. And so it really required a lot of uh, brainstorming on how to do this. Uh, certainly this is, um, are you serious? This is a challenging time in our country. Um, as we all cope with the impact of COVID-19, I do hope that you are all uh, doing well and are safe in your states and local communities um, as we manage through what is a very apparently a, a, a very a strong second surge of this pandemic and which will likely be affecting uh, many of you in terms of how you work uh, as well. I know for neuropsychologists, as I'm going to point out uh, in my talk, uh, uh, the incidence of COVID really reflects how we do our work. Um, so uh, this has really become the age of telehealth, and uh, no, uh, and psychology is no exception. There are many advantages, of course, to incorporating technology into delivery of healthcare. 
But one important factor to keep an eye on is um, making sure that in so doing, we don't inadvertently create greater healthcare disparities that already exist. So my goal today is to discuss how neuropsychology has adapted to COVID-19, um, but in so doing, needing to face the challenges of bridging healthcare disparities, which affect our most vulnerable groups, uh, including uh, our patients with serious mental illness. You can see on this side, I, I'd like to start on, the, on this slide to really contextualize the situation in terms of our um, very diverse and growing diversity in our country. Uh, more than ever with the intersect intersecting pandemics of both COVID-19 and structural racism, understanding the vast health um, disparities in our country has never become uh, more urgent than now. We live in a very diverse country and that is uh, wonderfully growing. And um, the US demographics are shifting every day. Whereas 100 years ago, one out of eight uh, people living in the US was from an underrepresented ethno-racial status, um, in 2010, it was 35%. And if you look on the graph to the right, what it is showing is that the distribution of US population um, is becoming even more diverse. And by 2050, um, white non-Hispanic uh, people will be the minority in this country. Um, and in particular, the Hispanic population is growing exponentially. So when we think about healthcare disparities, we have to be uh, very vigilant and, and tackle these problems because they're becoming greater and greater. All right, um, what are the healthcare disparities? Well, I'm, I, I'm sure you all know the major healthcare, healthcare disparities um, that exist in this country. U.S. residents are not equal in health um, by any means, uh, both uh, in terms of life expectancy, uh, disease burden, death rates, um, and health outcomes, and not the least of which is access to healthcare services, which is particularly important uh, during this COVID times. Uh, not to mention that we, it's all become abundantly clear that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected underrepresented groups in our country and in particular the BIPOC community. Uh, health disparities also exist in individuals with serious mental illness. Um, and here's just some of the research that I imagine that you are aware of as well. Non-Hispanic Blacks and other ethno-racial groups are five times more likely to have a schizophrenia diagnosis. Um, they have a higher risk of being big, um, misdiagnosed with schizophrenia. Those with psychotic disorders have higher rates of involuntary admissions, higher rates of interaction with law enforcement, less likely to be enrolled in outpatient and mental health services and adhere to treatment. They're more likely to have limited access to care, more likely to uh, lack insurance coverage, more likely to experience implicit bias or really racism. And um, this is unacceptable. And this was research stemming pre-COVID. So uh, the situation is not good. And um, in adapting to uh, uh, COVID times, one has to be very vigilant about how to not exacerbate um, these most vulnerable groups in our society. So what has neuropsychology done to um, adapt to, uh, to COVID-19? I'll tell you, uh, neuropsychologists have had to really transform the work that they do. Um, and also consider how to maintain access to care and also how to maintain the validity of their assessments. Um, we are a profession in which we assess people's cognition, attention, memory, visual spatial functioning, executive functioning, 
We do this mostly through pen and paper tests, some computerized tests, but it is a, um, an assessment that is conducted with utmost precision, attempts for precision and accuracy. Many, of, uh, many times uh, patients are timed on their responses. Uh, there are timed responses for how stimuli are presented. Uh, instructions are delivered for each test are delivered in very um, are verbatim, delivered in verbatim ways, and um, there's a high degree of control that is required for neuropsychological assessment in order to get valid and reliable results. So, um, as you can imagine, um, now being in thrust into a pandemic where sitting across uh, the table from a patient, uh, a client, and having uh, necessary control for all of those variables uh, is, extraordinary, it is an extraordinary challenge. If we think of the in-person uh, standard of pre-COVID being the gold standard of uh, not being masked, sitting in an office space um, together with the patient uh, and working side by side or across the table and um, administering tests in standardized ways. Uh, neuropsychologists don't have that luxury right now. And that can have significant impact on the findings and results of neuropsychological assessments. So um, we've had to become quite creative and um, at the same time be very vigilant and um, careful about maintaining um, and reducing all threats to the validity of our assessments. So what have neuropsychologists done? Well, uh, since COVID, uh, there have been an expansion of teleneuropsychology which is really the uh, evaluation and assessment of neuropsych neuropsychological tests uh, through uh, video conferencing and, and the computer. So um, some folks have modified and maintained in-person testing. If you look at um, these four choices, the number one in-person standard being the pre-COVID standard, um, some neuropsychologists have been able, at least for some time period, been able to continue in-person work. But it, this needs to be in an, a modified way to adapt to the threat of uh, COVID transmission, obviously. Um, and so earlier on in the spring, there were uh, trainings uh, for neuropsychologists at a national level to, to um, help them understand what kind of medication procedures are required uh, in order to continue to do in-person uh, modified testing. This, of course, has to uh, require uh, PPE. Um, many neuropsychologists not only use PPE, but they um, have uh, used plexiglass across tables. They um, have sanitization um, uh, procedures in their offices, in their clinics. They have HEPA filters to monitor and reduce um, and improve air quality. Um, they have office procedures that require them to stagger patients so that there's minimal contact uh, between patients coming and going. Many neuropsychologists have decreased the volume of their work to manage all of the um, uh, COVID uh, procedures that are necessary to keep people safe. Um, and, and of course, all of, all of these neuropsychologists who are doing in-person modified are also at the same time keeping an eye on COVID levels in their community. I would say that um, in my experience and having spoken to neuropsychologists across the country through the IOPC task force, what I generally saw was that um, neuropsychologists in the Midwest who had much lower rates of COVID in the spring um, were able to adapt the work that they do for in-person modified. Uh, now it's the reverse that um, because the COVID levels have become so big in some states that even in-person modified work is not feasible. 
Now, remember, neuropsychological evalu evaluations are uh, often multiple hours long. So we're not talking about a 10-minute appointment with a patient who um, you can have sit six feet away, um, but you're really having to interact with a patient for a long period of time. And so that does increase the, the threat of transmission. Uh, an alternative to this um, is in-clinic teleneuropsych. And uh, this is a situation in which patients go from one, or are placed in one room, and uh, neuropsychologists sit in another room in the clinic, and they video conference from one room to another, and the evaluation is conducted in that manner. And as you can, as you can imagine, that situation very much keeps both clinician and patient safe. And the fourth situation, you, um, we have neuropsychologists sometimes doing tele, uh, neuropsychology remotely to the patient's home. So both patients and neuropsychologists are in their home environment. Now, you know, as you can imagine from my description of, of uh, neuropsychological assessments, that is a, a very much a trickier um, setup for neuropsychologists because the, of the lack of control over the environment. Um, disruptions in the patient's home, disruptions in the clinician's home, um, variable internet, uh, timing, uh, knowing what um, the quality of the images projected to the patient's home is. So the, there's a lot to consider with remote teleneuropsychology. And I, I, in my experience, I, uh, I, I, I know that many neuropsychologists really use this as a last resort um, for really lockdown measures or in situations where um, uh, limited kinds of testing happen. And of course, there are also hybrid versions that neuropsychologists are doing. So these are not mutually exclusive from one another. In um, my particular clinic at Cambridge Health Alliance, we're doing an in-person, um, in-clinic teleneuropsych setup, um, but we are doing all our interviews and our feedbacks with patients um, uh, to their home through video conferencing or phone. So um, there are hybrid ways to conduct assessments. All right, so just to give you an idea of what this might look like, because um, it, is, it is a complex endeavor. Again, uh, in-clinic teleneuropsychology is really not just um, video conferencing from one room to another. It is really uh, a very complex setup of moving from one, um, from evaluating different aspects uh, from one room to another. So what you see here, and I'm going to, uh, attempt to explain this a little bit more carefully is that the room that the picture on the left represents the clinician's uh, office and um, my neuropsychology fellow Holly here is um, playing the role of a client um, and sitting at uh, sitting at the uh, desk in a separate room and so um, on the left what you see is uh, the clinician's room in which there are two computers and um, two webcams, and uh, likewise in the patient's room. The right-hand computer on e in each of the images represents just normal video conferencing so that the patient and the um, neuropsychologist can interact with one another. The computer on the left on, for both the patient and the clinician uh, represent how stimulation are, are presented. So on the left, you see that there is um, a little elevated structure on which a stimulus book is flipped open, and that's being projected to um, the computer on the left and side, the left hand um, computer. You also see the little sticky pa um, papers uh, on the table here, in which if the patient is required to draw um, because we often measure visual construction skills, um, that is being picked up and being uh, shown in the clinician's room. And the placement of the papers are within those yellow stickies um, so that we have absolute um, ability to see exactly what the patient uh, is drawing. Uh, there are other features to this kind of setup that we maintain. Um, if you notice, the, it, this is just, you know, 
finer details, but the uh, red folder on the right hand side represents different folders that are placed in the patient's rooms so that they can at, at any one time be directed to open that particular folder for a particular test. And then they place the, um, the, the form that they fill out uh, in the envelope that you see on the right hand. And they keep filling the envelope at the end of the session. They place the envelope um, at the side of the door, um, which the uh, neuropsychologist will then um, uh, pick up typically hours later. And so we don't usually um, touch any of the papers until um, any potential uh, virus has been uh, dissolved. Uh, so this sort of just gives you some idea of the complexity that is required in doing um, this kind of teleneuropsych in clinic. And as I mentioned before, uh, neuropsychologists in making decisions of what kind of modality of care that they are using um, will have to balance uh, and think about the different trade-offs uh, between competing threats. Uh, tradition, traditional non-mitigated neuropsychological practice may result in the fewest competing threats to the validity of the actual assessment, but greater risks to safety. Uh, and depending on the health risk of a particular patient uh, and the community of COVID incidence level at the time, different decisions can be made. Uh, In-home teleneuropsych may result in the fewest threats to safety, but it has substantial risks to validity. So these are the kinds of um, questions that neuropsychologists um, have to contend with. I think it's also especially important to recognize that not only do teleneuropsych assessments um, have to contend with these validity threats and these complex decision making, um, one of the factors that goes into these decision making is to think about possible and um, contributions to major healthcare disparities that already exist. Um, this is related to neuropsychology, as you can see from this setup, but it's also related to healthcare in general. Um, what is becoming increasingly obvious is that at the intersection of healthcare and technology is really a digital divide, um, which is creating a chasm of already existing healthcare disparities. Um, at this point, we don't know, um, and we won't know for a while, what percentage of neuropsych assessments are teleneuropsych. Um, it clearly depends on the COVID incidence and the development of the field. Um, but this incidence is not insignificant. So we need to think about the impact of telehealth and teleneuropsych um, for neuropsychology and, um, and its potential to magnify already existing disparities. I want to begin by acknowledging uh, some of the advantages of telehealth um, because it, there are plenty of advantages. I actually think this um, pandemic has launched healthcare into the digital world in ways that we'll never go back from, that will always incorporate aspects of telehealth into um, our work. Uh, and, and of course, there are many advantages to doing that. Um, certainly, the during the pandemic, the decrease of COVID-19 transmission um, has made this the most convenient way to provide healthcare. Um, and, and there has been research showing adequate to good acceptability by psychotherapists and good acceptability by patients um, to psychotherapy through telehealth. Uh, that also appears to be a reasonable alternative when there's time and distance constraints. And for telepsychology, most studies report similar outcomes to traditional face-to-face -face psychotherapy, um, though largely based on non-pediatric studies. Um, and, and there have been some studies showing similar diagnostic impressions um, for most disorders uh, in comparing telehealth versus non-telehealth. And so during the pandemic, what we saw was a really an initial surge in telehealth in the months of April, May, um, uh, and June. And this, but this led to a plateau. 
And uh, the plateau happened in part because uh, the medical field could only do telehealth so much in terms of some medical specialties really require hands-on um, evaluations, uh, dermatology, I mean, you name it. Um, most medical profession, professions require um, uh, in-person evaluations and, and hands-on assessments. So there, there was a plateau uh, in the telehealth surge. Uh, for neuropsychology, telehealth has actually been around um, the in-clinic telehealth model, that is from one clinic to another or from one room to another in clinic, there has been substantial uh, uh, evidence for the equivalency of telehealth uh, in, for teleneuropsychology versus uh, the in-person gold standard. And this actually started in the early 2000s in an attempt to increase access to neuropsychological assessment assessments for people living in um, more rural areas. And so um, these, uh, situ this situation of teleneuropsych was, was actually constructed to help um, folks in these rural areas come to the, go to their nearest clinic and then remote into a larger city or town where a neuropsychology, neuropsychologist was located um, so that they can do their neuropsychological evaluations. So there actually had been pre-COVID um, some research in this, uh, in this area. Uh, and I won't go over the, the details of the research, but just to let you know that it is evidence-based, but it, it, uh, more work is really needed. And, um, and certainly the remote, remoting to home situation has not um, had any research in this area. So shifting this now to, um, to what are the barriers for telehealth? Um, it became quite obvious uh, in my, um, at my clinic at Cambridge Health Alliance that our patients, not all of them had access to uh, computers and, um, and there are other uh, barriers as well that others have started to write about, not only in terms of neuropsychology, but in terms of telemedicine in general. Um, absence of technology, digital literacy, reliable internet coverage, privacy, linguistic access, and disabilities. Um, these um, are disproportionately affected by underrepresented groups and vulnerable groups, such as our patients with um, serious mental illness. And so this is something to be very mindful about. And I want to review some of the um, some of the work in this area because I don't think it's getting enough uh, airtime um, with the preponderance of telehealth that is happening. Um, so let's let's turn our attention to reviewing just some of this um, some of this work. For example, the U.S. Census Bureau 2015 show that one in three U.S. households headed by a person 65 or older uh, do not have a desktop or a laptop. And over 50% of um, elders uh, do not have a smartphone. Children in low-resourced families are much less likely to have a computer in the home. Uh, there's reduced patient technology access for underrepresented groups, especially. Um, we know that over 30% of Black and Latinx children do not have a computer in the home as compared to white children. 15% of Latinx and 12% of Black Americans rely on smartphones. And low-resourced families uh, live in homes with less access to privacy for telehealth. We see this a lot at Cambridge Hospital. Uh, even when we do our initial interviews and feedback, um, having patients uh, have a room in which they're not interrupted or they feel that you know, the walls are secure enough that they can speak freely and in privacy is a huge, uh, a huge problem. And when uh, we first went into lockdown, I had my fellows call patients and just get a sense of who had access to computers and who had private situations. And really, um, just over, 
just under half of them were had um, had computer access. So this is not a small problem. Just to give you some idea of the research, um, certainly the uh, access to computers in home have been increasing dramatically um, over the years, but uh, really it's uh, still far lower than we would like and that we absolutely need in order to provide healthcare um, to all our patients. Uh, the access to uh, computers and internet gets even lower when we start um, uh, the, uh, separating the data by race um, and ethnicity. And what you see here is uh, no surprise, which is that non-Hispanic whites have uh, more access to home computers and home internet use than um, Blacks and Hispanics. Um, and the situation becomes even more dire um, through uh, by family income. So uh, low-resourced families have much leather, much fewer access. And and then we have the intersecting um, populations as well, which makes the situation uh, very complex. Uh, even if patients have computers at home, they may not have reliable broadband coverage. Um, and uh, this is not a, a very, I think, a communicated aspect of uh, the work for uh, telehealth, but as, essentially there has already been um, published data in, in medicine showing that lack of broadband internet is associated with fewer telehealth visits uh, and it hampers patient portal use. Um, problems with poor coverage are pronounced, more pronounced uh, in states with a high percentage of rural areas, uh, of rural residents. And then we get into the issue of digital literacy. Um, and so even if patients do have a computer in the home and they have broadband coverage. Um, the next question is, are they digitally literate? And although this might be an assumption for many Americans that, um, especially uh, Americans in, from well-resourced families um, that have really uh, embedded the use of digital technology into their homes, this is not the case for, um, for everyone. And uh, there's definitely a generational gap that uh, is happening. So what do, we, what do we think about, how do we define digital uh, literacy? Well, uh, the PIAC defines it in a very basic way. That is skills associated with manipulating input and output devices, like how to use the mouse, um, how do you use a keyboard, Awareness of concepts such as file folders, scroll bars, hyperlinks, menus, and the ability to interact effectively with digital, uh, uh, digital information. 16% or 31 million Americans aged 16 to 65 have been deemed not digitally literate. Uh, adults who are not digitally literate are on average less educated, uh, older, um, more likely to be uh, Black, Latinx, or foreign born. And uh, older and Black patients are much less likely uh, to use their healthcare portal, which is uh, a huge problem as we're clearly moving into the age of telemedicine. Let's not forget disabled Americans um, who are also less likely to have computers, smartphones, or any internet access. Um, and disabled Americans are three times as likely as those without a disability to never go online. So I'm going to go through this, um, a couple of these slides fast so that we can uh, get to some questions, which I definitely want to take. Um, I also want to bring up uh, how teleneuropsychology affects uh, and telemedicine affects Americans with limited English proficiency. Um, in the field of teleneuropsychology, there are no studies on how to do teleneuropsychology for multilingual groups. 
Um, and um, as you can imagine, adding an interpreter into the process of teleneuropsychology through um, video conferencing is an additional level of complexity. At Cambridge Health, we, we've been uh, working diligently on brainstorming ways um, to be able to resume access to our patients um, who require interpreters. And what does this mean for patients with serious mental illness? Um, certainly, uh, just a second here. Uh, certainly, the advantages are similar to the rest of the population in terms of increased convenience. Um, patients with serious mental illness, uh, as we know, can uh, often have difficulty making two appointments uh, through lack of transportation, um, or really sort of the degree of planning and organization and effort that's required to get to an appointment. So um, having telehealth options for patients with serious mental illness can be a really positive uh, bonus. However, there's disadvantages as well. Aside from the barriers affecting underrepresented groups um, and, and certainly vulnerable groups that I outlined that can include serious mental illness, there have been uh, a growing number of studies looking at uh, digital uh, access in uh, patients with serious mental illness. In a 2016 study in Connecticut VA by Ann Klee, uh, she looked at a technology usage in veterans um, who are a little older, a mean age of 56, and um, only 80% of them had cell phones. Um, and unfortunately, even of those 80%, only 13% had a smartphone, and only 30% had a computer. Um, other numbers, 56% imported having um, internet, and 47% said that they used email. Uh, again, if you're not on email, you're not going to get on a healthcare portal. If you don't have access, you're not going to get on a healthcare portal. If you don't have a smartphone, um, it becomes a lot more difficult to do video conference um, appointments, especially if you don't have a computer. And we know that from research that computers are even less, um, less available than smartphones. And so um, this is a challenge that we uh, may unfortunately be contributing to in, in, during this pandemic if we don't actively try to um, get around this. And I would be really interested to see what people um, on this call are doing to provide access and whether they've seen limited access to some of their patients um, with serious mental illness. Um, there are not only these divides in terms of um, the healthcare disparities and access to digital technology, as well as digital literacy that I've talked about, but there may also be challenges that are pertinent to the illness itself. Um, what we've noticed at Cambridge Health Alliance is that some of our patients with serious mental illness um, prefer not to be on video. Um, they prefer to use the phone. And that may be um, part of the illness and feeling um, watched or uh, uh, not safe through video conferencing. Um, and, uh, you know, that could work for some portion of treatment, but ultimately I feel like most clinicians would say that they would like to see their patients in person to uh, uh, keep up with general assessment of how they're doing. Um, we also know from the Anne Clee study that um, uh, some, there were a high proportion of patients who did not um, feel comfortable trusting computerized therapies or digital surveys and assessments. And this we've seen at Cambridge Health where some patients just don't feel very comfortable um, answering our uh, surveys and our assessments um, by, by phone. And then probably one of the less spoken to, but uh, needing to be attended aspect is that we know that research uh, from research in uh, neuropsychological 
um, uh, disruption in folks with primary psychotic disorders, that they can um, have challenges to attention, concentration, uh, memory, planning, and having uh, these patients then be on Zoom for 45 minutes is taxing. It's taxing to folks with normal attention, um, let alone for folks that are not. And so uh, this could be a high demand and require a lot of cognitive reserve in order to uh, continue to do um, traditional uh, appointments through telehealth for uh, this patient group. Uh, so what do we do about it? Um, for neuropsychology, certainly in, cl in clinic assessments, um, can, uh, if they are COVID uh, safe, definitely offer a, a, better, a resolution to some of these, um, some of these challenges and uh, certainly reducing healthcare disparity. Uh, and I would encourage others to think about their own specialties and how they're addressing that. Uh, digital technology and literacy and internet coverage are crucial, are becoming even more crucial for everyday tasks such as banking and shopping. And now they've become critically important for one's health, given the massive transition to telehealth. So we must not forget our vulnerable populations who suffer from the effects of the digital divide. Um, the solutions need to be taken on multiple levels, um, not only discipline specific, uh, but really at a state and federal level as well. Policymakers, public health officials, community leaders should work together to ensure that healthcare access is not compromised because of the shift to virtual care. Um, it has been proposed at a national level that the FCC direct part of its budget to increasing telemedicine investment. Uh, a few states have been creating partnerships with private companies to improve telehealth participation and getting access to uh, patients with smart, who don't have smartphones, for example. Um, uh, the Greenlining Institute of California, for example, has developed a digital health equity team comprised of policymakers and uh, public health experts and community leaders and students to generate solutions to improving digital health equity. Uh, what does this mean for practitioners uh, in mental health treating SMI and neuropsychology? Um, certainly there's great interest in expanding the range of treatment into the digital world world phone access smartphone access means certain types of deliveries can be used which is wonderful. Um, and um, programs to expand access to smartphones can go a very long way to reducing healthcare disparities. Um, at the same time, we may, need to be mindful of um, who's getting left out and how to, how to maintain access for those uh, patients. So in conclusion, uh, as our field, uh, in mental health progresses to the next stage uh, for the COVID-19 era and beyond. We want to be cognizant of the impact of the new technological advantage, uh, advances. Uh, we should progress in a mindful way so that we don't ac uh, limit access to our field. Uh, some solutions will require a multiplicity of modalities of cares uh, until such time as people can access and um, there will be greater knowledge to to technology. Uh, and some solutions will require innovation to be able to ensure that all persons can be equally facile with digital technology. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna stop there and, and welcome um, any questions and uh, comments. Well, Maggie, I just wanted to thank you so much for that wonderfully informative and helpful presentation, um, you know, particularly as a neuropsychologist, it was really useful for me to hear about the advantages as well as some of the challenges being faced by offering telehealth services for neuropsychology, um, as well as some of the creative solutions that you've been using, um, as well as other 
others in the field have been implementing. So we'd, we'd really like to hear from all of you now uh, with any questions, comments, ideas that you might have. And as I mentioned in the beginning, please don't be shy. We're really hoping to learn from one another in this. And you could just type questions right in the chat box and we can respond to those. And Maggie, actually, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I was thinking more about the issue of digital literacy that you mentioned and was wondering what specific solutions that you've used or others have used that seem to be helpful. You know, I have been wondering about whether introductory sessions or sending information ahead of time may be a useful strategy or again, any other ideas um, that you've been using. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a wonderful question, um, Raquel. And certainly we're completely mindful of that with our in-clinic teleneuropsychology. We have, um, have been constantly sort of upgrading our computer systems to have um, patients have minimal interaction with the with the computers so that we can almost essentially bypass that particular um, situation. I mean, for some patients, using the mouse is something that's novel for them. Or as you know, in our um, in our field, our patients are coming to us for questions of cognitive um, challenges, uh, dementias, cognitive impairments. Uh, we have patients that, you know, who may not be able to uh, attend very well uh, for a long period of time. And so this becomes even more complex for neuropsychology. Uh, but certainly there have been, I, I have come across multiple articles that have suggested that on a federal level, the Department of Education should um, propose national-based programs of digital literacy, especially for older persons. Um, again, it, this is not something that is just going to be relegated to uh, telemedicine, but just for everyday life. Uh, with all of the complexities and all of the um, aspects of our world that is becoming much more digital. And so this too needs to be uh, dealt on a national and state level. Uh, in, in our service, we don't really have individual trainings, but if, you know, if, I, I would say that would make some wonderful sense for programs for which, you know, there are uh, assess digital assessments that need to be conducted or other regular interfacing with computers uh, and technology. And I, I feel like you, we just can't assume that patients um, know a certain level of uh, of interacting and using computers. Right, I, I agree. And I think, you know, even for younger people, we can't always make that assumption that they're going to have a certain degree of digi digital literacy, particularly to go through some of the neuropsych assessments that we might be using. Um, so it's really helpful to hear that there are different strategies that are being addressed to deal with this a little bit better. Yeah, and, and if you think of the in-home neuropsych models, um, you know, that is also another competing threat to that kind of model, uh, especially for older patients in terms of uh, having them relying on them to be facile with the computer in order to complete assessments. Uh, in my experience, those kinds of uh, in-home remote neuropsychology has uh, worked best with the younger population, as you can imagine. Uh, but not necessarily kids. Kids with developmental issues, um, you know, they, they don't um, necessarily uh, sit in front of a computer for a long period of time. Um, and I've, I've heard quite a few stories of, you know, children running off um, and leaving the neuropsychologist sort of waiting for the child to come back to the computer. 
Um, I'm sure this happens in, uh, in, you know, in psychotherapy visits video, through video conference as well. Uh, there are definite limitations. Right, I bet. Looks like we have um, another question that came in. Uh, someone asking, what is the status of insurance coverage for phone telehealth visits compared to video visits? How can we advocate to keep these reimbursed in the same way, given the apparent equity issues? Wow. Well, that is a real passion of mine through my work at uh, the Mass Psychological Association and also through um, my chairship of the Professional Advocacy Committee um, at the American Psychological Association Division 40, which is the neuropsych. It is absolutely crucial. I know that APA, the American Psychological Association, has done quite a bit of advocacy at the national level through CMS to try to um, get telehealth phone sessions um, covered and um, have been successful in doing that for temporary. Um, and it's going to take ongoing advocacy in order to get that uh, extended uh, indefinitely. Uh, it absolutely is an equity issue and at the, at the Massachusetts state level we have uh, advocated with multiple insurers around that. Uh, I'm adamant and uh, that this needs to um, be uh, covered in exactly the same way as video conference and in exactly the same way as an in-office visit. And I know that work is being done, and I and I know that it's being done in other states as well. Right, and from my understanding, Maggie, thus far there is that kind of coverage, or at least during the pandemic, it's it's been offered, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, through the IOPC, we created. If you go to the IOPC net. Um, there is a, uh, we have a page there that goes state by state um, detailing what insurers are covering for um, teleneuropsychology and telehealth by extension. Um, so you can go on that website and see if your particular state has coverage and also for how long. Um, so there is a database Excel sheet um, that we've created that will tell you how long this is going for because for for now, it really is confined to the state of emergency um, of the pandemic. Um, there is ongoing work, as, as I said, to extend this beyond, but it is uh, limited. All right, thanks, Maggie. And I'll, I'll see if I can find the IOPC website so I could share that link with everyone because I think there is a ton of useful information on that site about a lot of things that you discussed today, including these insurance issues. So I'll see if I can find that. Um, looks like we only have a couple of minutes left. Any um, final questions or thoughts and comments that anybody has before we provide some wrap up statements? Rachel and Vanessa, I think you have some closing remarks I'll, I'll let you make while uh, I look for that IOPC website to share with everyone. Um, yep, yeah, so thank you all for attending today's webinar. You'll be receiving an evaluation form right afterwards. Thank you for joining us today.